I would like to say good evening and welcome to everyone to for joining this very special event tonight brought to you by the River Country Campaign at Friends of the Earth. My name is Megan Williams and I'm the coordinator of the River Country Campaign and I'm really pleased to be bringing you our latest online discussion as part of the hashtag Revive Our Rivers series. Tonight we're talking really about two topics. One, water for the environment, and the second one, cultural flows. What are they? How are they different? What are their similarities? And what do they look like when they're released into our rivers, wetlands, and floodplains? Who better to explain these concepts than the former head of the Commonwealth Environmental Water, David Papps. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. That's okay. And Hi, everyone. And also joining us is Brendan Kennedy, who is the Taddy Taddy representative for Mildren, which is the Murray, uh, the Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations group. And before we go any further, Brendan is going to give us a digital welcome to country. So um, over to you, Brendan. Hi, everyone. Um, Dalkin Yaganindi. Good to see you. Good to be here talking about water. Um, we generally, my people, where I come from, Taddy Taddy and Wadi Wadi people, we, we're not in a position to give welcome, but we do acknowledgements, acknowledgement to country and acknowledgement to ancestors. So I want to pay my respects to all the country that everyone is, is, um, is on. And I want to pay respect to all the ancestors from all those countries um, and also pay respects to the elders, um, ancestors from the past to now and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And I would also like to pay respects to the elders of the country that I am on. I'm out on Barkindji country right now, actually. And uh, the Barker, the Lower Darling River, is no doubt one of the most heavily impacted stretches of the river in the whole Murray-Darling Basin. And for everybody joining us, whether via Zoom or via Facebook, we'd love to hear from you. I'd like to invite you to acknowledge the country you're standing on and pay respects to your elders in the comments. So drop us a comment, let us know which country you're coming from and what you've come to learn today. And so I think the best place to start uh, this discussion is to define what environmental water is. So David, perhaps we're gonna start with you on this. Fish don't live in trees. Why do red gums need water? <laughs> well, um, there's so much of our, of our life that is governed by rivers, floodplains and wetlands. And while I concentrated on the Murray-Darling Basin and the work that I did, um, it's fair to say that just about everywhere is uh, in some catchment or another. We all have a connection to rivers. We all have a connection to floodplains and, and wetlands. And, and with those natural places comes all the fauna and flora uh, that is dependent on water. Uh, and that really goes to the heart of environmental water. What is environmental water about? It's really not much more complex than, than water that's specifically allocated to, to help rivers, floodplains and wetlands stay healthy. And although I might end up talking mostly about rivers, I want to emphasize the integrated nature of the environment that we're dealing with. Rivers, wetlands, floodplains, they're connected, they're dependent on each other. And of course, all the plants and animals that live out there, uh, including river red gums and black boxes and all those other things are dependent on, on uh, regular flooding in between the droughts to survive. And that's what Water for the Environment is about. Mm. And can you tell us about when water for the environment became a concept that, you know, people were aware of and began to be implemented by a government? So the idea has been around for a long time. And, and let me acknowledge now that, that for Indigenous people and Indigenous communities, it's been there forever as an idea that has assumed shape in in government circles uh, and in academic circles. Uh, it's certainly been around uh, in the early 40s and 50s. There's always been a very 
deep understanding at the scientific level of the interrelationship between uh, rivers, floodplains, wetlands, and the plants and animals that are dependent on them. And an increasingly sophisticated understanding of how ecosystems in those places work. So the combination of everything and how everything is entwined and, and interdependent. So that idea has been around for a long time. The sort of intellectual basis to environmental flows has been with us for a long time. The practice of it uh, more recent. Uh, in Australia, the states have been doing environmental watering for some decades, but at any scale uh, where you've got significant amounts of water that are available to the environment, specifically to the environment, it's really only kicked off uh, in the Murray-Darling Basin, at least uh, in 2007, culminating in the Basin Plan uh, in 2012. So at the scale we're talking about, with the amount of water we're talking about, relatively new. Mm. And so uh, I think it's fair to say that there is a lot of misinformation in the community about the role of environmental water. Um, can you give us some examples of what environmental water looks like when it's, you know, what does it look like when it's in holding, you know, when it's, when it's an allocation and what does it look like when it gets released into the environment. Okay, so it varies a bit across, and I'm talking about the Murray-Darling Basin because that's where we're operating. It varies a little bit, so, so I'm gonna generalize. Um, in the system that's being brought in under the Basin Plan, under the Commonwealth Water Act, the environment, if you like, for the first time really owns a significant chunk of water. So there are entitlements, which are water licenses. They're the same sorts of things that irrigators own, rice growers, cotton growers, um, everyone who, who farms in irrigated agriculture has an entitlement or a range of entitlements. And so for the first time, the environment owns those same sort of entitlements. Uh, in the Southern Basin, uh, water uh, is stored in dams against those entitlements. There are allocations made each year. When there's plenty of water around, you get all the water that you're entitled to. When there's not, you get a smaller amount. And so the system that we've got uh, enables the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder and the other environmental water managers. I want to acknowledge that there are plenty in the states doing a great job, have been for years, for decades. It enables the Commonwealth Environmental Water Holder to manage that water. And environmental watering is really about the right amount of water at the right time in the right place. So first of all, we need to understand what do we want from the water? What are the outcomes that we're looking for? Healthy environment is the grab all, but we need to be much more specific about that. So for example, in the Goulburn River, where we spent uh, a lot of time uh, doing some watering, we were focusing on two things, fish, particularly golden perch, and the vegetation, the native vegetation that grows on the riverbanks and is so important to the health of the river. And so that's, that, that's what environmental water looks like in the environment. Releasing water into the Goulburn from the dams at the right time of the year in this case, to get golden perch breeding, to get them spreading through the system, or to try and restore some of the native vegetation on the banks that's been knocked about by drought and water flowing at uh, too, too consistent uh, and too high a level. Mm. And uh, like, what about, um, can you give us some other examples of when an environmental flow is delivered to a wetland or a floodplain? Like what, what does it look like and what kind of benefits does it have in, in a specific area? So it looks like lots of different things depending on the circumstances. Uh, the one thing it generally doesn't look like because uh, we can't do it because we don't have enough water and it would, be, it would be dangerous anyway is we can't replicate big natural floods. So those massive floods that you get in the basin, they're all natural. What environmental water is doing is in between the big floods is trying to reintroduce some of the flows that have been taken out by dams. Dams do a marvellous job for irrigated agriculture and for communities, and they're important. Uh, we don't decry that. But one of the byproducts of dams is that they eliminate the sort of flows in between the big floods. So environmental watering is about putting that variability back into the river. Flows are up and down and trigger different processes. So for fish, for example, uh, there's quite usually quite specific flow regimes to start them breeding. They won't breed unless the temperature of the water is right and unless the flow regime is right. So that's what you're doing. You're trying to put that water back into the environment to make up for the flows that have been subtracted by us occupying the floodplains and using all the water in the rivers. 
Uh, and then it then depends again what you're looking for, whether it's for fish, whether it's for vegetation, colonial uh, water nesting birds. So add in some of those great wetlands like the Narran Lakes and the Macquarie Marshes, where you get massive floods uh, every now and then. Inundating those wetlands brings in thousands and thousands of birds, breeding pelicans, ibis, spoonbills, all sorts of birds. Those one-off marvelous events where you where you get a massive boom in bird numbers breeding. They're fundamental. Now, what we see in many of those places is that you'll get a big flood, it'll trigger the breeding, but there's not enough water left to get the birds through, the baby birds through to them being old enough to survive on their own. So for environmental water, for example, we can put environmental water in after the flood and keep things ticking over so that you don't get all those little birds starving to death. Um, and, and that's the way that environmental water works generally. Uh, and again, it depends what you want out of it. Sometimes we want to just shift salt out of the environment and out of the system. Um, other times we're focused on birds or plants or fish, all those things that need water at the right time in the right place. And there's just a question coming through in the comments. So, you know, like a, a good watering event will um, provide those benefits for those uh, targeted species, depending on the event. Is it just the birds or the fish in that event that benefit or are there broader benefits for people and, you know, other species that might not be targeted? Yeah, invariably there are broader benefits because everything's so interconnected. So I talked about the golden before, one of my favourite examples where we were working initially on getting golden perch, which weren't breeding, getting them to breed. But in doing that, you're creating flow conditions in the river, you're creating habitat for a myriad of species. So... You know, yabbies, snails, uh, invertebrates, all the things that everything depends on for food get going. The fish get going. When the fish get going, uh, the turtles get going. So even though there are specific requirements for a specific species, when you're putting it in, there are lots of almost, I won't call them accidental byproducts, but certainly the benefit spreads across a large number of species. And of course, there are benefits uh, for communities as well. The healthy rivers are healthy places to live. Uh, there's lots of recreational opportunities. People love being in these places, kayaking, photographing, camping. Um, you know, you get a lot of benefits, recreational benefits and economic benefits from these flows as well. Mm, fantastic. And that's probably a good point to bring in Brendan. So, Brendan... You've prepared us some slides to kind of talk through the basics of cultural flows, but maybe before we get to them or while while I set those up, can you talk us through like the difference between cultural flows and, you know, David's talking about benefits for the broader community of environmental flows. Do Indigenous people benefit from these broader um you know, the broader benefits that come along with environmental flows? Well, first, before I, before I sort of address that, I just want to declare, you know, from the Tati Tati Wadi Wadi people that we are the sovereign and rightful people that continue to hold water rights and responsibilities for caring for all of our country. And that includes all of our traditional waterways, cultural landscapes, ancestral sites, cultural heritage, languages, law, customs, and ancestral totems and animal species. This is our inherent right um, that has been bequeathed to us and it's our responsibility. And this is where we derive our ownership as traditional owners. And we, the traditional owners, we've never ceded our sovereignty, nor have we never ever relinquished nor given or traded away our inherent rights to any other foreign individuals or parties or governments. So. We do, we have not, and we do not consent to others acting on our behalf, nor do we authorise anyone else to manage our country, including our water. Um, and so we do, we have never, nor should anyone else misinterpret nor take um, our involvement in these, in this sector, in the water sector, environmental sector, should never be taken or misconstrued as us giving consent or uh, relinquishing our sovereignty. So we've never ceded our sovereignty. Um, just the difference there straight away, just hearing David, and I do know the difference. Um, I think you've got up on the screen there, the, the Tukula decoration. 
And yep. so that's that's uh, been endorsed by the Mildren, Murray Lower Darling Rivers Indigenous Nations, 27 nations, the Confederation of Nations, also the uh, NBAN, Northern Na Nations, Northern Basin. So, um, but I think uh, just to put it quite simply, I think what we're looking at two different things. One, one is through the eyes of uh, Europeans, through the eyes of the coloniser, um, looking for those benefits, particular species, particular outcomes. Whereas the other cultural flows, it's through the eyes of the people who have been here for up to about 100,000 years. So they're, they're, they're like chalk and cheese. Albeit it's water going to particular areas of country that will um, will bind traditional owners, First Nations, and you know the mainstream, which and the land and the waters and all the, all of our species, but we're basically coming from two totally different lenses. One, as I've said, the European colonizer colonizers lens, and the other cultural flows is coming from the lens of the First Nations, First Peoples. Great. And do you want to talk us through these slides? You just let me know when you're ready to move to the next yeah, slide definitely. and you can take, it, um, take us through them. Yeah, you brought up the, um, and, th and that, the Echukla Declaration, 2010, obviously in Echukla in Victoria, on the Murray, um, where, where we came together. You can, you can Google this, the Echukla Declaration, you can download the whole declaration. So it's available um, and it's recognised. It's recognised, obviously, by the First the Nations, um, but it's now being recognised by the, you know, by by the Commonwealth, and to an extent, some of the states. Yeah, if you want to mm. flick to the next. Um, yep. Yep. Line. So I will just read it, just in case anyone can't see it yeah. on the screen. So it says that cultural flows are water entitlements that are legally and beneficially owned by the Indigenous nations of a sufficient and adequate quantity and quality to improve the spiritual, cultural, environmental, social, and economic conditions of those nations, and that it's at your inherent right. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, you know, that, that really hits the nail on the head. You know, the water is owned by the First Nations. Um, and, and how the benefits that are derived and created in cultural benefits for us as human, human beings, but also our ancestral animals, all living um, beings within that are going to benefit from that water. It, it's up to us to decide, interpret and express um, those benefits, including the social and cultural benefits, the economic benefits, the spiritual well-being of everything that's involved in that in that uh, cultural flows events when they do happen. Mm. But this particular here is so we've had um, you know there's been a lot of investment in this in cultural flows, and you know it's come about because of the you know over two hundred years of the way water has been taken away from our people and, and been managed on our behalf without our consent um, to the detriment of the environment and to the detriment of our people. So, you know, our people got together with some very smart minds and uh, there was a team put together and um, they created what is called the, uh, the cultural flows uh, documents. We have this one here and there's also um, so this one really touches on the pathway in a legal sense to um, water law and, and policy across this country, particularly, you know, the basin. Um, but the next particular guide, if Megan, if you can move on, is, and it also allows for um, the First Nations communities, traditional owners within the basins. So it's a guide we can create our, our own documents. Um, Cultural flows management plans is an example, which uh, some of the nations are already already doing, progressing well. Um, so these are guides. It gives us it gives us a bit of a flow chart, a bit of a um, a guidance template 
for us to develop our own version of a cultural flow. Because a cultural flow for my country and wetlands in my country, will, you know, they won't necessarily be the same as cultural flow for other nations and other landscapes. So, um, you know, First Nations are really gearing up and really moving ahead on this. Um, some of the states are moving with us, but it's just a matter of some of those water managers um, who are delivering water on behalf of the Commonwealth or the states. Um, and that's the thing, we want, it's a real balance here, making sure particular stakeholders or agencies don't fall behind in this. Um, because at the end of the day, it's, in, you know, it's our land and waters, but also our people um, that hopefully that will benefit or, or if we don't get cultural flows, then um, you know, the opposite effect can happen. Mm. So for us, um, yeah, you know, this is for First Nations, you know, this is builds a pathway for reform in um, water legislation, water law and policy, but it's also a pathway to strengthen our nations, our First Nations, our interests, our roles in water management. That's a, that's a very important point our role in the management of our water. And that's done culturally. Um, this will help support our, our, we got our responsibilities. That's been, that's one thing that's been relieved upon us. Relieved of us is our responsibility, albeit we did not consent. So it'll support our cultural values for, um, for water. It'll obviously enhance environmental outcomes. <laughs> that's, you know, that's a no brainer. You know, um, and of course, it'll build the socio-economic opportunities around the water space for our for our people, First Nations people. Mm. So yeah, and then look throughout throughout these cultural flows documents. You know, there's been some really strong statements that really makes it really clear around how water is sacred for us. It's our source, our symbol of life. It provides our resources and our aquatic ecosystems, enhances our spiritual and cultural economy. So, you know, as we always hear elders saying, the rivers are the veins of the country. Um, that, that is the probably, you know, I don't think you can put it any more clear though. The veins, the rivers are the veins of the country, carry water to all the parts of the country, the kidneys, you know, the wetlands of the kidneys and the filtering of the water past through land. That's our responsibility, not only for all of our animals and our, our species, but also for Mother Earth, the land, Mother Earth, and also all our people downstream. So we're shepherding the water through country, shepherding it through so it, it moves on down to the next lot of people who do the same. It has been, they've been doing it for so long. Mm. Next one. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so this is a bit of a graph that's come out of the um, the cultural flows document. So it give, so we're trying to do it all these cultural flows, explaining it in obviously from our perspective, but also put it in into the um, Anglo European Australian way in explaining, because unless we don't explain it properly. And that it's understood, then we're always going to have this misconception, you know, that oh, environmental flows is the same as cultural flows, vice versa. So it gives us here, you know, our rights to secure the water rights and um, and then influence the water landscapes. And then there's our transformational foundational needs um, that that will be enhanced out of that. So yeah, it's basically, you know, it's a pathway to an enduring cultural flows is what we've been on this trail about for a long time. And there's many steps um, to dealing with you know, our cultural values and ecological and hydrological values. So, you know, and, and creating and changing laws, creating strong laws and policies that will protect cultural flows going in the future, which then will build that strength 
and enduring ways um, that are require us requires our water rights, re reasserts our influence over the water landscapes, supporting new water governance and foundations and placing First Nations at the heart of water, you know, the water base, water management um, in this country. So they're just a few, yeah, topics to talk about. I mean, this is only a snippet that I'm talking about now. There's so, there's so many of us invested in this, in the First Nations, so to the top, right through the middle and to the Southern Basin. Um, and we have a lot of people supporting, you know, not just First Nations people, but there are a lot of um, people working in agencies and working in, in this space who, who are getting a strong understanding of, of cultural flows. Mm. And there are some questions coming through the comments feed. Uh, and just a reminder for everybody that uh, has joined in, uh, we're having a conversation about environmental flows and cultural flows with Brendan Kennedy and David Papps. So the comments that are coming through on the feed are really questions about, you know, how much cultural water is allocated out there? How much, how much water is actually able to be used at the moment? How much water is being used at the moment yeah, for the environment for cultural, for cultural purposes for, for cultural well cultural purposes and this is where you know um there's there may be some miscommunication or confusion around you know water being delivered which then enhances cultural purposes now that that's that's probably environmental flows and where they may be involving some First Nations people um, as part of, you know, an engagement process, whether that's come from the Living Murray or whether it's to do with cultural heritage around water delivery, you know, into certain landscapes. What we're talking about here with cultural flows is entirely different. Um, and, and, it's, and it's, you know, like I'll give you a great example now, like we're, we're working on a project at the moment in my country and you know there's a proposal to put environmental water in and look and sort of maybe highlight some cultural outcomes and and that may well be the fact um, but um, certainly it does not um, it, it, it doesn't sort of equate to a cultural flow it doesn't it doesn't any meet anywhere near um, all those varying degrees and and necessities that will eventually you know become a cultural flow what gets categorized as cultural flow so there, there's a lot of work to be done but obviously first thing is we need our water we need to own the water um, and if that's going to be water that's you know in the hands of the victorian environmental water holder or the commonwealth environmental water holder um, whether there are some mechanisms for agreements to be made between those agencies and First Nations, or particularly Mildren or NBAN, then I think that's probably a good starting point for the nations themselves, and then work it and and work out. Look, how how do we we have a transaction of ownership of these water resources, and then start to build in. We start to build in all those key elements, which which makes up what we, what we as the First Peoples, what we view as a cultural flow. So I think that's a good starting point. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, David kind of talked about how some of the outcomes from environmental water might be, um, you know, birds breeding or bringing birds that have bred to maturity or, you know, like different, there, you know, there are different environmental outcomes that are measured what are the kind of cultural outcomes? Like, could you name some of the things that a cultural outcome looks like? Are you talking to David? Yeah, uh, uh, to you, Brendan. What, like, what, oh, what kind of, what do cultural outcomes look like? You know, can you give oh, us some specific examples? Specific examples. Um, well, obviously being able to practice our culture. So 
you know, we've got we've got so many aspects of culture, as as does you know the Western Western world. Um, but to be able to live in our landscapes with our water, practice our culture, enjoy, you know, um, good health, to be healthy people, to be healthy spiritually, uh, economically. Um, we go back prior to European um, invasion. We have, our people had you know, one of the most strongest economies, you know, on earth for us and it was the most complex and it worked like clockwork. You know, our, our, our economies, our landscape was thriving, obviously, our natural resources. So what we were exchanging in, in our economies, we were making sure that it was sustainable. <laughs> so it worked so well. So there's our, obviously our cultural, spiritual, um, and also another thing too is our mortality rate being able to live longer, live healthier, you know, have access to our water country, which we don't have access to our water country. We have access to our water country, we have access back to our ancestors, ancestors in the landscape. So, I mean, it's, um, it's quite a complex question or complex answer. Mm. Uh, the question quite simple, but the answer is very, very complex. Mm. Um, it could be all day. Mm. Yes, yeah, so we could be here all day. Um, but so maybe we'll, we'll shift gears then. So there are some more questions coming through about the basin plan and cultural object, uh, like outcomes from the basin plan. But can you talk us through like uh, cultural water wasn't ever included in the basin plan. So is there any push to have them incorporated together and you know how are you hoping to achieve um well, cultural outcomes and behalf, policy i won't i won't sort of speak in a futuristic way on behalf of all the nations so in terms of um combining cultural flows within the within the, um, the water act or the, or the basin plan that's something we we progress you know as a, as a whole nations within the basin so it won't be me saying that um well we've been locked out of the water space for so long um and it's it's really taken a lot of people over 25 30 years longer since Milton started and then ben started that um these really strong people and elders have been pushing for our our voice within the water space they've been doing that and hence and today we're we're starting to you know really see a lot of um yeah, we're, covered, we're making up a lot of ground in this space. Obviously, we now we have cultural flows, um, you know, momentum. But, you know, we've been locked out of the space for so long and now cultural flows is, you know, it's really now, it's only just in recent years, the last couple of years, where, you know, the, the notion of cultural waters, cultural water um, from the mainstream, they're really starting to recognise. But that's something that we've never lost. We've always had this. Um, it's not something that we just made up in the last handful of years, um, but we just haven't been listened to. We haven't been included in the in the in the conversation. Um, now we're starting to be included in the conversation. Mm. And I'll just ask you one more question before um, I bring David back in. So there's another comment coming through about. Um, you know, a year or two ago, there was this $40 million allocated to buy cultural water that, you know, how, what's happened since then? So that, you know, that was in 2018, I think, that there was some money allocated to buy cultural water, but we haven't seen any water entitlements given to um, any Indigenous nations you know, what, what's happened in the meantime? What's the hold back and how is it working oh, out? That, that's nothing to do with cultural flow. Right. So that's, a t that's a, another topic. That's some money that was been thrown um, towards the First Nations in the basin, you know, to purchase some water. Um, but, yeah, no, that's, that's not attached to cultural flows at this stage. Right. And can you explain how, you know, like, if First Nations people bought water with that money, how is that, would that not be cultural flows? Um, well, 
I notice there's a message there around purchasing water and getting water licenses and purchasing water, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there are there are a couple of individual First Nations people who are doing that now, you know, who have purchased water, who have had water licenses and have had water um, for, for their own purposes, whatever it may be. Um, but that's certainly not cultural flows. And that's certainly not what we're talking about, cultural flows. Um, whether the government turns around in the future and looks at setting aside water for us and funding or funding to buy that water, certainly $40 million ain't going to buy much water. Um, so, or whether there's some sort of a, an understanding between the, all the First Nations and the, and the Chew and the Views and the MDBA. I mean, these are, these are things that are yet to happen. Um, so anything else that's these small sort of um, exchanges or transactions that's been happening certainly don't, don't measure up um, anywhere near to becoming what we consider to be a, a cultural flow allocation. Mm. Great. And so, David, just to bring you back in, you know, like that, thank you very much for that explanation, Brendan. Um, you know, how do environmental flows and cultural flows, how do they sit together? Or, you know, are they part of the same world or are they actually just very distinctly different um, concepts? Well, well, I think Brendan, Brendan's... Um, earlier comments on that have been spot on. Um, and he, uh, of course, speaks with, with cultural authority that I don't have. I think the observation I'd make is when you, when you listen to Brennan explaining that so, so beautifully and so elegantly, you, you begin to see that environmental watering, as important as, is, as it is, and uh, as important as it is to get right under the basin plan, is just a, a small part uh, of a much broader cultural agenda for Indigenous people and, and communities. And I think, you know, my only observation really is that uh, Indigenous communities and Indigenous people, uh, their thinking in this space is so far ahead of politicians and so far ahead of the legislation that we're all working under that really you're just sort of shoehorning things in around the edges to get to the space where we can truly say that we're dealing both with Indigenous cultural uh, uh, beliefs and, and, and issues uh, as, and, and environmental watering in a much more Western traditional way, you're going to have to have a fundamental change, I think, of law and, and institutions um, and, and really come to grapple with that issue that it's got to be Aboriginal ownership and it's got to be Aboriginal management. Uh, and there may be some steps along the way that involve greater and greater involvement in things like in environmental watering. But as Brendan's pointed out, it's not the same thing. And so I think we're in a position where the politics has got to catch up. has got to catch up with the thinking and all the effort that's been put in by Indigenous communities in this space. In the meantime, if environmental water managers uh, like I was uh, and exist, uh, at the moment in, in the states and at the federal level, then, then obviously we've got an obligation to be involving Indigenous communities as much as we can. And trying to keep the environment, trying to keep the environment going so that when there is an opportunity for Indigenous people to resume their place, then it's not too screwed up. Uh, so I think there's some steps, some transition steps where we can help. But as Brendan said, the, this is, requires some, some real rethinking and some real rejigging of what we've got out there. Mm. And short of that, um, you know, like larger system change that would see cultural flows, like what kind of considerations are given to um, the traditional owners where environmental water is being delivered? Well, I think it's a work in progress. Uh, I mean, I haven't been the chew for two years, uh, and I know that in that time there's been some real effort continued to put into this space trying to, first of all, enable Indigenous communities to become more involved in the decision-making. So looking for environmental watering objectives that reflect Indigenous values and Indigenous priorities and trying to get them into the planning system and into the decision-making. And I know when I was the two, we were starting, I think Brendan talked about it uh, with that, that fundamental work that was done on cultural flows and what it means and how it might look like. We, we were also trying to help 
um, build up capacity for uh, Indigenous communities in particular to be able to participate in the decision-making process. It's no good turning around and saying, oh, you can help us make decisions if we're not being supportive and we're not providing um, resources uh, and engagement so that the decision-making contribution that the Indigenous communities can make is as good as it can be. So, you know, the, it's a work in progress. We're learning. I think Brendan made this observation in his comments about, uh, you know, uh, what progress there's been in, in, in Western understanding, uh, even though it hasn't been complete, I acknowledge that. And so we're still learning about those spaces where there's commonality and where we can contribute in some small way through environmental ordering. Uh, and, and I think it's about engagement, meaningful engagement in real decision making. Mm -hmm. uh, while we wait for we wait for the systems and the law and the politics to catch up. Mm. And Brendan, of, Megan, can I just sort of and like David D triggered some thoughts for me there around we're looking at the fire at the moment, the issue with fire. And if fire was worth money, we'd be living in inferno, you know, country at mm. the moment. There'd be fire everywhere. Fire is not worth money. But now, um, returning to all the First Nation traditional owners around um, to bring back cultural fire, you know. So, like what David said, I hope we don't wait until it's too late, and and then, you know, the mainstream will turn around to the to the traditional knowledge holders, um, especially with water. You can't you can't afford to uh, you can't afford to let it go that to that stage. Uh, water so precious yeah. and vital um, for the for the country. Mm, absolutely, and there have been some comments um, talking about the lack of uh, cultural water or any water really on the Lower Darling River over the last few years. But so I also want to pick up on um, you know David's points about involving Indigenous people in those decisions where environmental water is delivered. So this is obviously um, not an application of cultural flows, but can you speak to any firsthand experience you've had in um, being part of the consultation and decision-making when environmental flows have um, been put onto your country, Brendan? Um, in all my years, Never. Only, only yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> yeah, only yesterday was the first time, and it's um, a mountain of water for a little area. But prior to that, there was the Living Murray um, 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, some projects around. Uh, Had a Lakes is an exact example. Um, but really, they were only involved in traditional owners for the cultural heritage. Um, compliance with the heritage legislations um, because obviously they've got to construct, build some structures around holding water and delivering water. Um, but no, we, we very rarely, and when you think about this now, I'm only one person and there's another person downstream, another person upstream, but we're talking about all of our First Nations peoples being able to, you know, enjoy and be involved in what we are pushing for cultural flow. Because there's no point only a certain amount of people we're benefiting around. And it's, only, and it's the same with all our, our animals and birds and fish um, and plant species. You know, and we see as like, well, there's only, only a certain amount of areas that are receiving this environmental water. But um, these are decisions that are not made by First Nations people. We've never been asked, where would you like the water? When would you like the water? How do you want the water? And how much? And what quantity and what quality? So these are the key questions, you know, around, because we just don't want, um, we don't want toxic water. We don't want waste water going out into our country. And we want clean, clear water. Um, we want healthy water. We want enough water. And we want that water um, delivered uh, through the country that we know because where water is to be delivered, 
And sometimes water gets delivered from the opposite end in the country, mm. um, which is wrong. So, you know, like we, we deserve to be at the forefront co-designing and part of the decision making right from the inception stages. Yeah. Mm. And I'm wondering if the Margoya Lagoon is an example of that. What, is yeah. that right? Yeah, classic yeah. example. And could you talk to us about what the Magoya Lagoon is and how um, First Nations people are involved in it? Well, it's a very special place. It's an ancestral place. And um, it receives water from the weir pool, from the river. You know, the, the lock holds the lock 15 holds the water up. With it. And, um, but it comes in and I, I tried to explain it is that the water, it's coming in, it's its its like trying to drink water upside down, pouring water, you know, from, from your bottom. Uh, that's how water's being delivered. The water's got to come through, through the entrance, through the mouth, and then it comes down through the, through your system. And then it comes out through your bottom. <laughs> Very I mean, simple. when you say it like that, it seems simple. Like how how do the people managing water right now, how do they not get that right? You know, like there must well, they, be something in the landscape that is less less simple. I put that. it that way a couple of years ago, then we made it really clear. <laughs> and but their water comes in through the through the through the through the bottom end and it gets held in that way and it doesn't get to come in. So then all the water species, certainly the platypus can't come in. Mm. Certainly the river rat, yeah, river rat, Rakali, um, Golpi Maramun, that's our river rat, our turtles, all of these important species can't come in. They won't come in that way. <laughs> They'll only come in the way they're supposed to come in, you know, and it's the same everywhere, you know. Even right down at the bottom of the system, you know, we've got the Kurong. You know, it's it's one of the most vital, you know, key places, eh, hey, within the whole landscape. You know, that that plays a very special place all the way up through the basin, all all of these waterways and all of these um, organs, and that, and the water's got to come through the right way and and. And that's how we see the landscape, not just convenient delivering water for the sake of delivering water. We're going to get, we're going to count the frogs and we're going to count the birds and we're going to count the fish and we're going to see some green leaves. And that's, you know, that's good. Um, but, you know, I say go back to the, uh, go back to the knowledge, the people of the knowledge of that country. And, and they'll tell you, and they'll show you. Before it's too late, as David said, it's too late because we're losing a lot of our people all the time. Mm. So you're losing all this knowledge of country and water. Mm. And I'm also wondering, you know, like what else needs to be done before it's too late? So we've probably got about five minutes left. You know, what... what what are the steps from here? What do, what do we need to do, David? How, how can we solve all our problems? Uh, yeah, can't answer that one. Uh, look, uh, just reinforcing again what Brendan is saying um, about, you know, there's things that need to be done now um, so that we don't wait, hand over everything in such a bad state that it's too late for traditional custodians. So, you know, I want to acknowledge that the Basin Plan is a compromised document. It's not perfect. Uh, it's far from perfect but it's the only one we've got at the moment. So while we're waiting and pushing hard to try and get some real systematic change, while we're waiting, we need to do some basic things. We need to buy the additional uh, 450 gigalitres of environmental water that was promised, that was signed off by all the states and Commonwealth. They need to do it. They need to stop obfuscating about that. They need to get that because we don't have enough water, as Brendan says. You're doling it out here and there and missing a whole lot of important places. We need to fix the constraints in the system without going into the technical details. There are physical constraints and rural constraints that stop us from doing some of the things we need to do to get good environmental outcomes. Uh, 
and we need to get the states to make sure that their water sharing plans protect the environment uh, as well as they did before the basin plan. Uh, and they're the sort of my, you know, things that need to happen now. Then there's a whole bunch of stuff that we need to think about in broader terms, as Brendan's been talking about. Uh, but I just think there's some imp really important stuff that we haven't finished yet. Uh, and, and we need to get the, the plan as, as compromised as it is. We need to get it implemented as well as it can while we, we build momentum for a better product. Mm. And we do have a uh, petition going at the moment to uh, make sure that we buy back more water. So I've just popped that in the comment in the Zoom and it should be getting posted in the Facebook chat in just a moment. Um, but so, David, just like to finish off on that point, you know, can we walk and chew gum? You know, are we able to do these smaller things under the basin plan and bring about this this broader systematic change yeah we should be able to uh, we haven't been able to up until now i think it's a lack of imagination and courage on the part of politicians um sure I, the bureaucracy needs to be held accountable and i'm okay with that but we really need to understand who makes the decisions in this space and it's the politicians it's the governments at federal and state level and they need they need to find some courage and they need to find some vision and to do as you suggest fix the thing now uh, and start building for something much, much better, including dealing with all the sorts of issues that Brendan has raised. You know, now is the time for some real political leadership. Can we do it? Well, I'm feeling a bit pessimistic at the moment, given the current political leadership, but I live in hope. Mm. Mm. Great. And um, Brendan, what do you think? Like, what, do you have anything to add to that? Well, we have to get away from, so there, there has to be a massive shift and change here because at the moment our river systems are basically irrigation channels. If that's how we're going to treat the land, and I know there might be farmers and irrigators and everyone out there who want to put in the new dam and run a pump down, but there's got, I mean, we can only do this for so long we can, only, we can only view and treat our water systems, our river systems, waterways like this for so long. Mm. Um, but until we reverse and change the thinking that they know they are not just irrigation channels, they're not just water storage facilities. These are living, breathing um, entities, waterways, landscapes, cultural beings and, and living and breathing um country mm. and and that's until we don't tweak back to that way of thinking and just look at you know the, the Murray Island Basin is just a big commodity uh, it's just a, an endless pit money-making business then um you know we're just going to keep going down this track and we just yeah. there'll be less and less water for to put out on the country and eventually we'll run out of water. Mm. So that's where we're going in the next 50 years. So, mm. you know, there's still time to make some changes. But, yeah, um, yeah and that's what we do as, as the First Nations peoples is we just keep asserting, you know, the rights of the country and the rights of the water and the rights of um, all living um all the living beings that rely on that water, that includes humans. Mm. You know, we, we've got to have our, we've got to have farms, we've got to have, you know, use of water, but we've got to change the thinking around how we're going to, how we're going to um, sustainably use the water to feed ourselves and continue to develop an economy. Um, but not at the very, you don't sacrifice the very asset, the very essence of why you are living in this area, in this country in the first place. You know, if you're living in these river towns, well, without that river there, you wouldn't be living there. So, you know, down the track, if you destroy what you got, then you won't be living there. You'll have to go and live in the city. Mm. And there won't be life in the city if we don't have, you know, what we get out of the country supporting those cities so 
catch twenty two. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, it's just about gone time now. So I might just say a really big, wonderful thank you to both Brendan Kennedy and David Paps, who have joined us online for this really important conversation about what environmental flows do and or what water for the environment does and how cultural flows are a much, much broader concept and really um, the change that we need to see sustainable management in the Murray-Darling system. Um, if you have gotten something out of today's conversation, you can uh, drop some change into the uh, tip jar, the Friends of the Earth tip jar. It is a, a very big conversation and it is one of many. So um, yeah, if, if you can spare it, it's obviously a very difficult time uh, for everybody. Um, but if you can spare a few coins, you can drop us at some change in the tip jar. But of course, the most important thing you can do, as David said, is um, get involved and get active and get onto your politicians uh, or get into politics and be the political leadership. You know, it could be you sitting at home, be inspired. So sign our petition to buy back more water, get involved in the River Country Facebook page, follow us, um, follow us on Facebook uh, and get on our mailing list to see what else is coming up. It's a difficult time to organize uh, with the way the world is at the moment so online is uh, really the best medium so find us on all the platforms um, and we will hopefully be keeping up these conversations uh, for a very long time into the future and seeing real change so yeah once again thank you Brendan thank you David uh, and thank you thank to you. everybody at home thank you. no worries thanks everyone see you later thank you Sorry. thanks Brendan thanks David see you mate see ya bye see you, Megan See ya. <laughs>